Hello, everyone. Oops. Uh, unfortunately, Zoom doesn't allow me to see uh, the list while I'm presenting. So I assume people are coming into the room now. We're going to get started in just a minute. All right, uh, so we're going to get started. Welcome, uh, everyone, um, to Rust and Tell Berlin for for March. Uh, we're doing things a little bit differently uh, this month, um, as everyone here probably can tell. We are not somewhere in Berlin, but we are rather on the interwebs. Um, shout out to anybody who is coming to us uh, who does not live in Berlin, um, welcome to probably your first Rust and Tell uh, Berlin uh, that you've been to. Um, we're happy to have you here. Um, and uh, we are going to have a great uh, night of talks uh, and also a small code challenge at the end. And um, hopefully uh, things will go smoothly. This is the first time we're doing this event online. So um, bear with us if you have any questions or any, um, uh, uh, any technical questions or anything about the, the stream or anything like that, feel free to write it in the Zoom uh, chat. We also have our matrix chat. Um, hopefully you have the instructions for joining that. That's where um, we'll do more of our, um, uh, more of the uh, kind of talk about the actual talks and things like that there. Um, so real quick, uh, a little bit about uh, who we are. Um, I'm Ryan Levick, um, and you can't see my Twitter uh, handle because it's covered by Ferris, but um, I'm at Ryan underscore Levick on Twitter. Um, so feel free to reach out to me. And I'm Bastian Grube, um, also a Rust um, full-time developer for about a year, and you can reach out on me, find me on LinkedIn or on my website. And so like the concept for the meetup is um, the first time it's super digital, but even here it's for the beginners to the expert. So we just want to hear about your ideas, your um, struggles, your hacks or projects. Um, we want to have just um, every month um, two to three hours where we can come together as a Rust community and um, talk and share about our uh, struggles or, or love for the language. Um, and really what that means is that we would like you um, to, to participate. Um, and that really also means people who are joining from outside of Berlin. Um, I'm probably, I'm pretty sure we're going to be doing this online again in the future, um, unless things go really well, uh, then uh, we will be doing this online in the future. And so we are open to having talks from people who are not based uh, in Berlin. Um, 
and we really want you um, to to speak about uh, anything related to Rust. And uh, if you think we're not talking about you specifically, um, we are. We mean every each and last one of you. Um, we want to hear, um, even if you've only played with Rust for a minute, uh, give us your first impressions. We'd love to hear about it. And we follow the Berlin Code of Contact. Um, we want to have a safe and a fun space. Um, every one of us is um, spending their Emma free time and their Emma private time on this uh, meetup. So we want to behave nicely. You can share um, on a secure code. You can share what you want and you shouldn't be like arrested by it. And um, if you feel not welcome here or you feel that something um, happened at the meetup, please report us privately. You can create a fake email and email us. We will follow through every request which comes our way. Uh, so this slide is normally for our sponsors. We don't have a sponsor uh, this month, but we would like to have a shout out to Jan Erik, who has helped us set up uh, the matrix and the Zoom. Um, uh, this is based uh, off of the infrastructure uh, that was used for um, the Oxide 1000 conference um, that happened uh, last week, um, uh, which was really great uh, for those that weren't there. The, the talks are now online, so check, check that out. Um, and so thank you very much, Jan Eric, for your help. And um, today's talks, um, we have um, Bram, who talks about integers in the small, big, and macro. We hear about a project from Wayfair, which is called Tremor, which I think it's a runtime. And we hear from Josh about async HTTP. So I think all different types of interesting talks today. And just a, a little note on um, breaks. We will have one uh, roughly 10 to 15 minute break after the second talk. Um, and we'll break out into to breakout rooms uh, where if you are feeling up to it, you can chat with your fellow Rustations about uh, anything and everything. Um, and then we'll bring you back in when the talks are ready to go. And of course, feel free to um, mute your mic and your, uh, and your webcam. If you don't want to participate, there's, there's no obligation there. So thank you very much um, for that. And without further ado, we will switch um, over uh, to our first speaker, uh, Bram, who will take hey. will talk to us about a very interesting thing. So take it away. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Um, you did mention before that the talk is recorded. So I'm not sure you mentioned that, but um, if your webcam is on, you might be on the recording. I um, just want to make that doubly clear. Let me figure out how to share my screen again. Um, good. All right. Oop, that wasn't meant to start the conclusion. Um, that should work. Good. Um, yeah, welcome. Thanks for organizing this. Um, Ryan, Bastian, and Jan Eric, because stuff like this really breaks up my week in a nice way. It's, um, it makes it a lot less boring and monotonous in these testing times. I hope everyone's okay, um, given the circumstances. So my talk is gonna be about a crate that I wrote. It's called uh, Small Begins. Can you see my cursor, by the way? I'm assuming that you can, because I'm using it to point out stuff. And uh, awesome, thanks. And the talks for the slides, the slides for this talk are on this URL. And there's also some links in the, in the, uh, the presenter notes, if you want. Um, my name is Ram Jaron. I work at a company called Confiamo. We make data virtualization and governance stuff for enterprise, um, but it's not related to this talk. This talk is about Rust, and I think Rust is really amazing because um, I find it super satisfying that um, when you create a program, maybe it's not always the easiest language to create a program in the first time, but when it works, it really works. You don't tend to get no pointer exceptions, or uh, there's a lot of funny stuff that you could run into in production, or uh, wherever you use your thing that you didn't expect uh, when you wrote the program. And then it, it takes a lot of time to fix the thing. Um, 
with Rust, I have this less. I think a lot of this comes from the, the type system and the compiler. Um, it just nulls are not allowed, stuff like that. But I think another part is because the abstractions are so cheap. So new types, for instance, are structs with a single field. They're practically free at runtime, not entirely free at compile time. Um, there's like small overheads, but it's really negligible. And um, I think this allows people to create better abstractions more often. They, they don't tw think twice, you just make a new struct. And, uh, stuff like this, not just the abstractions, but stuff like this, um, not just new types, I mean. Um, it really helps to make uh, a great community with great APIs and great everything. And um, so this is a talk about making um, the right thing to do a bit cheaper. Um, unfortunately, in programming, uh, numbers don't just work. So um, numbers are a very common thing. <laughs> Let me give you an example. I've, um, I've got a note here. So that's the, the program for JavaScript. And you might want to calculate with some numbers. So maybe type a big number here. And uh, you might use numbers for counting the number of users that you have, or page views, or maybe uh, times. Um, or maybe, yeah, nanoseconds since an interval, and then you want to do stats on it. And so it, there's a lot of manipulations that you want to do with numbers. And so it's really useful when the numbers work. Um, but it depends on oops, how big you get. Because you see, if you've got this really big number in JavaScript, then you can't do plus one anymore. You can do plus two. Um, you can do plus three, but it rounds really funnily. And so I think numbers are often something that don't just work yet. yet. Um, and it's a pity, it, it bothered me a bit, so I made a small crate about it. The crate is super simple. This is not going to be a super difficult talk, I hope. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought it could be fun to explain anyway. So the thing that you just saw is because JavaScript uses 64-bit floats. And that means that there's about 53 bits of precision. If your numbers go above 53 bits, then you can only store every other number. So plus two works, but plus one doesn't work anymore. And when the numbers get even bigger, then you get even less precision. And this is a surprising thing. You probably expect your numbers to just work because they always work. But sometimes, yeah, you suddenly get something that you didn't expect. Uh, Rust has something different. I think it's better, but it's also not perfect. So in Rust, when your number gets too big, then your program crashes. It's really annoying. Then you can fix it. And then um, it's probably easier to debug the crash than to debug a wrong answer, but it's still a bit annoying. Other languages tend to do uh, wrapping integers, which you can also use in Rust if you want to. Uh, so then if you have a big number and you multiply it, then uh, maybe you get zero all of a sudden, or maybe you get something negative or something else funny. Um, also not really ideal. And I come from, uh, I used to use a lot of Lisp and Python in the past. And those languages tend to have big ints, uh, which are optimized and everything just works. And uh, I thought it's a really nice experience that I want to make it slightly easier in Rust as well. Um, I just want to say from that, I, I didn't do any of the hard work. The real hard work is done by this crate, non-big int. And, uh, but let me, let me just explain how they work. So with humans, if you, when I use numbers, you, you've got digits one to, one to nine, and uh, people learn that three plus four is uh, seven. So you have those, those graphics, and if you do plus on those things, then you get a thing, and you just learn it by heart, but it's not scalable, of course. So after uh, seven, eight, nine, you need to go to one zero, and then after one nine, you need to go to two zero, and then after nine nine, you need to go to one zero zero. And uh, this makes things unlimited, and there's certain algorithms for calculating. So there's all stuff that you learned in primary school, probably. Um, and uh, so non-big end does pretty much the same, but in a bigger sense. So big u is the type of numbers that we're going to use, or that we use internally in this crate. And uh, it's just a vector of digits. The digits are not 0 to 9. The digits are 4 bytes each. They are u32s. and uh, but yeah, so the, the type definition of the type is super simple. Uh, the hard part is writing the addition. So the stuff that you learned in primary school, but now it's done on computers, basically. Um, yeah. This is all great, but it's not perfect. 
because uh, you always have to go to the heap. You see, this is a vector, and the vector is, I think, 24 bytes on the stack or wherever uh, the, the, the big unit will be stored, and then at least four bytes on the heap. So um, it's it could be quite big. If your big, big unit is just storing the number five, then you're using a lot of bytes and you're using one indirection to store the number five, which is not always awesome. And for uh, signed integers, it's even a bit bigger. And the speed is also, it's acceptable, I think, in, in most cases, but it's not amazing. So I think about 10 to 100 times as slow as machine integers. Uh, and so this goes slightly against the second thing. So uh, when it's cheaper to do the right thing, I think you'll do it more often. And I think you'll get less bugs in the end, in the long run. So can we make big and smaller and faster? That's what the crate does. And I just use the, the small vec trick. So small vec is a type of vectors, but um, when it's small, it goes on the stack. So you can make a small vec of size eight integers. And then when you have five integers, then it stays on the stack. If it gets more, then it goes to the heap. And we just do the exact same thing. Um, so small big int, the small numbers go on the stack, big numbers go on the heap. You see, uh, this is the, the non big int type. So it's drop u int. And then we just either have a small one. Um, I've chosen u32, but it could be anything, I guess. Either this, or uh, we have a reference to a, an owned reference to a big u int on the heap. And so when it's small, it just stays on the stack. Um, this thing is 16 bytes, so it's still fairly big. It could be optimized more. I think if you use unsafe, then we can go to eight bytes for this UN type. And it could be made faster. The, the functions could be made faster as well. But it works already, and I think it's already uh, an improvement in certain cases. So uh, let's give it a go. I want to convince you that it's uh, fairly easy to use. So let me show you, I have a program here. And what does the program do? The program um, goes through all numbers from 10 million up, uh, from 10 million down, and it computes the prime factors. And uh, the algorithm is, itself is not super exciting, but uh, I'm just gonna modify this to use uint instead. So we'll start by just copying and pasting all the code and renaming the functions. Then we're going to call the new function in main. And we need to change the types. Instead of u32, I can use my new type uint. Uh, this example, by the way, is in the uh, repository of the crate. So you don't need to copy anything or whatever. Um, instead of these literals, we need to use uint small, which looks like a function call, but it's a const fn. So it doesn't take up any time. Now you still see we've got some compiler errors. And this is because uint, unfortunately, is not copy. Because in some cases, it can contain a reference to the heap. And types like that are never copy. So what we're going to do is, in some cases, we're going to uh, pass reference. So all of the function arguments, we're going to make references. And then we need to pass references to them as well. So that's here. And then there's a couple more things left. So any comparison needs to be between the same thing. So either a reference and a uint, or uh, sorry, between a reference and a reference, or a uint and a uint, or another type of number. Um, so um, but first, we're going to make current a actual uint, not a, a reference. Uh, right, so the comparisons, they're here. So we need to ref. Uh, the reference here. Um, comparisons already borrow. So we need to um, the reference here. And then here we want to return a fresh curve factor, not a reference. And this should have been it. Of course, this happens like it works well 10 times. Then um, what's going on? Ah, here we need to take a reference because we don't want to use up the curve factor. Embarrassing. This went well so often. Uh, huh.
right, I should be a star. Is that it? Hmm, <laughs> this should have been it. I probably mixed up a star with a ampersand or something. is the problem maybe otherwise i'm just going to leave it um yeah okay there's something really stupid in, in the code this worked fine five times but uh, <laughs> okay you see the amount of changes is not so big so there's going to be about i guess eight changes in the source code and they're all super small changes um yeah. <laughs> uh, the micro benchmarks. I included some benchmarks in the repository. And the benchmarks just do the same thing. So, prime factorization. And we do prime factorization on two numbers a big number and a small number. And let me just show. So, here the big number we use, we do with big ends. And you'll see that the big number with small big ends is actually a bit slower, which is not so great, but actually it makes sense because um, in the great small big ends, so we always have to do this check. So either it's uh, a small one or a big one. And if it's a big one, then we use the big end library, which is the case here. So we're never going to be faster than the big end library. We're always going to be a bit slower uh, on big numbers. But um, yeah, uh, you see that on small numbers, though, uh, we're also slower than machine integers. But of course, the advantage is that here we can uh, have any size integer. So we don't suddenly crash when you're trying to factorize a big number. Um, and we're significantly faster than big ends. So um, there's also always trade-offs, but I think it can make for a nice to defaults. Um, for the project I'm trying to use this for, we I really want to stay on the stack. So that's just uh, solves it for me. Um, there's some interesting things I could show in the API. So let's go to docs.rs. And uh, so there's just two structs basically in the API, and the struct implements uh, the structs implement a lot of uh, traits. And this would be really boring code to write. I also don't want to copy and paste this, so I want to do something with this. Um, there is some duplicated code between uint and int, and I just copy and pasted that and changed it myself because I think it's not worth trying to add extra layers of abstraction there. But um, yeah, for this kind of repetition, it's really not worth making the code be so big, I think. And I think there's something reasonable that we can do. So let me show you what I had here. So um, I considered using traits uh, programming. So traits and generic implementations. I think people from Haskell and Scala would use this, uh, or would tend to this at least for the first choice. Uh, I decided not to do it because uh, it's a lot of thinking to get this right. Um, you have to find the right abstractions. The trace system is still a bit limited. In a different application, I've run into a brick wall somewhere. Like, I wanted to abstract something, but the, the type system just couldn't deal with it, which was a bit of a pity. And it's also hard to explain for people who might want to come to your project. So instead, what I'm doing is macros by example. And they were great, actually. Uh, I think in general, code generation always works. Um, and especially in Rust, it's also pretty usable. So. The code is still fairly legible. Um, it's pretty robust. Everything is checked at compile time and CI'd. And the error messages and the ID support is also pretty great. great. You get the nice red squiggles. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the, uh, an example of a thing that I want to abstract from. So if you do 5 minus 3, then it should work. If you do 3 minus 5 as unsigned integers, that should not be have a result. This is what checked sub does. And uh, so there's two cases, either there's two uh, small numbers, and then we just uh, I just use the checked sub on the machine energy type, or you've got one or two big numbers. And what I do there is I convert both to big, or unless if they're not big already, and then I use checked sub on the big type. Um, yeah, so two cases, but this has to be done for int and also for check div and a couple other traits. So um, how I would like to do it 
um, I couldn't get this to work, unfortunately, um, is with a macro like this. So for all type in uint and int, implement, well, do this code, don't, don't execute it, but compile it basically, and then fill in uint for type here and here and some other places. I tried to make this, but um, it seems impossible to write this for all just with macros by example. Because if you want to execute, um, if you want to invoke macros, you can't return the thing that goes here. Um, it seems because macros can only expand to parent statements, expressions, items, and input items, according to the little book of cross macros. And that's probably smarter than I am, that book. Um, so instead, I found that the following pattern uh, is not as elegant, but it also works pretty well. So we just define a new macro for everything that we want to repeat. So here we uh, want to repeat checked sub for integer and uint. And then the variables come from macro rule itself. And uh, yeah, it's a bit less beautiful because now you have this new macro, but if the macro is not exported, I think it's okay. So um, yeah, so here we just call this macro twice, but then you can do other tricks. So uh, I made a little macro call with args and it calls input checked sub with no base arguments, but then first with uint and then within. So this macro call calls this macro twice. And then you can extend this. So um, you can add base arguments. So here we abstract from also the traits that we're implementing and the method that we're using. So for checked sub, we need to use the method checked sub. So those are variables here. And so we call uh, checked traits twice for uint and int. And then also six more times for different traits and different methods. And uh, I found this pattern quite nice. Um, there's some other bloats that you can get if you implement a lot of traits, like I do in this crate. So um, partial EQ with, um, with machine types, I wanted to do with all machine types. So U8, U16, blah, blah. And this is a bit much, can be a bit hard to see if, if you really have all the machine integers. So I just wrote a little help macro that practically calls call with arcs with all the machine integer types. And uh, so call with all unsigned base types. I think it's super easy to read and uh, macro programming can be really nice, I found in Rust. So that's my conclusion. <laughs> um, arbitrary precision integers are quite fast and easy unless you wanna do it in a talk. And you can practice live coding as, as often as you want, but you're still going to get it wrong in the talk. I find them easy in practice. Unfortunately, it's not copy, so you do have to do some referencing and clones sometimes. Uh, code generations can be decent and, tight, decent and tidy sometimes, and cheap abstractions. They're not just cheap. I think they're important uh, for the ecosystem, for your APIs. Uh, they just lead to better quality code, is my impression. Uh, thanks to NumBegint, because they really did the hard work again. And uh, thanks everyone in the community for making the community so nice. And I'm having a good time with Rust. Um, questions? All right, thank you very much. Um, I'll give you, since you can't hear the, the clapping, <laughs> there's clapping on behalf of everyone else. Give myself a little <laughs> Um, real quick, before we get to the questions, one uh, note, if you uh, do not want to be recorded, then make sure that your video is off. Otherwise, this is recorded and you will be seen in the video. So please make sure to every, everybody in the, uh, in the audience um, to turn off your video unless you want to be recorded for all of time. Um, and clapping is now happening inside of the, the Zoom chat. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. lots, of, lots of clapping emojis. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, one question here from Matthias, who's asking, since big int uses VEC internally, why not replace the internal VEC with small VEC? That's a good idea. I didn't consider that. Um, let's see how big would that be. So in the small case, then you would have a U32, um, I guess one U32, because uh, that would be the length of your small VEC. And then you want the capacity as well. So oh, it's a good idea. I think you would still end up at 16 bytes with an even implementation. Um, well, big, yeah, 16 bytes. I guess that would have worked. Um, yeah, I, 
I don't have the impression that it would be equally fast, but maybe it would have been. Um, yeah, I didn't want to clone and fork uh, numbergins anyway, because that's complicated code. And my code is a lot simpler. So um, yeah, it's a good idea. We should try that. Cool. Then some uh, collaboration possibility for, for people <laughs> in the future. Definitely. Uh, let's see, Bastian, did you see any more questions from people? No, not on metrics. Not yeah, I think the only other, there was a comment about um, how this might be an interesting optional feature for SIMD JSON. Um, perhaps oh. the, those who are working on SIMD JSON library might be interested in taking advantage of, uh, I approve. of, of this functionality. So that, That's a cool yeah, that would definitely be really cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bram, for your, for your talk. That was very interesting. Appreciate Ooh, that. Um, all right, and next we have Heinz, who will be uh, speaking next. So we're gonna switch over. Um, and then after Heinz is done, then we will be taking a, a 15 minute break. And again, for those who do not wanna be recorded, make sure to turn off your camera. All okay. right, take it away. Okay, first of all, yes, the SIMD JSON people will definitely consider that and do that. Um, so thank you, Bram. That's going to be awesome. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. Um, I'm going to talk about Tremor. Tremor is something we built at Wayfair and killed a thousand and more cores with that in the cloud. So I think we can say we are saving the planet. One core at a time. Anyway, um, the agenda. Even so, it's only 20 minutes. I'm German. I like to have an agenda. I make one when I go shopping. Um, so we'll start with a bit about ourselves, who we are, what we do, what Wafer is, because I guarantee no one here has heard about Wafer before, um, what Tremor is, and then we will drive into one part of Tremor, because I learned that the talk is 20 minutes, not an hour and 20 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, because it's pretty big, there's a lot to talk about what we'll focus on that. And <clears throat> at the end, we want to give a shout out to some open source stuff we have been using because, well, the Rust community is awesome when it comes to that. Anyway, what is Wayfair? Wayfair sells rocks and couches. So it is not a IT company in the sense of it's a vendors that shifts our perspective as developers because we develop for a production need and not for something we want to sell later. Um, it is pretty large, not in Germany, but in the US. Um, and it has offices in the US, the UK, and Germany. Um, and also sell stuff there. So if you want to go buy a rug, now that we all are at home, go buy a rug. Um, we have about a thousand people working in Berlin and 25,000 worldwide between engineers, marketing, sales, people in warehouses, people who deliver and whatnot. So not a small company. Um, and as a result, we do have a few computers running and doing stuff. Uh, who are we as a team? We are a small team. We are two people in Berlin. That is Dara, he hangs around in the chat. Say hi to him um, in Berlin with me. And we have Anoop in Boston. He's also in the chat. Say hi. So he represents our Boston part of the team. Um, we do system engineering at Wafer as the first team doing that. And what we've been building about the last year and a half, give or take, um, is Tremor, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> and yes, we do sometimes talk about it. If you're curious, we have all Twitter accounts. Well, Darach and me have Twitter accounts and Anoop refuses to be on Twitter. Um, but who knows, perhaps that account will exist eventually. Um, go say hi. We also have one for Tremor that is at the end, so you can copy it because we want to, you all to remember it. Um, so what is Tremor? Um, Tremor is an event processing engine. Um, it is also an ETL language. It is also a query language. Um, we have replaced Logstash and I am sure a lot of you are familiar with it. It's Java thing doing logs, obviously, with Elasticsearch and friends um, in Wayfair. And we have replaced Telegraph, the influx thing that does the last mile between, in our case, Kafka and InfluxDB, completely with um, Tremor. 
uh, we're now starting to get integrated with Kubernetes, so there is more stuff to be going. Um, I forgot to put it on a slide or deleted the slide this morning when I read the talk. Um, we, with this rolling out, we saw saved about two, three thousand cores and went to a reduction on infrastructure in this realm for nearly a factor of 10. Um, so for every 10 boxes that were there, now there's one, which is nice. Um, okay. Uh, We'll start with to get the understanding of the different things and why we are doing what we are doing a bit of cartography about event processing systems. Please note this is not scientifically accurate. There is no islands in event processing. They're just programs. Um, but this makes it really fun to explain. Um, don't come near me with facts about them. This is going to be funny, I hope, or, or really embarrassing. One of those two, but stay away with facts. Um, don't take it as a bad take, and I know it likes nuances, but well, here we go. Um, so first group of event processing systems is the, you're going to write some effing Java if you want to or not island. That would be systems like Spark or Fink. Um, so big, big data systems mostly, and <clears throat> they are used by developers who know how to write code who like to get their hands dirty and write low level logic in Java or equal languages. Um, the second is the archipelagos of let's cobble together transformations. Effectively, that is Logstash and friends where you just have a few building blocks that are programmed by the team that builds Logstash and you configure them, you change them in a, um, well, in whatever fashion you want to, to do what you want. That is usually used by operational teams who just need to get shit done, which is fair. Shout out to them. They are at the front lines. We as developers have the happy job. Um, so they like to get their stuff done. It is easy to configure, but it gets unwieldy when it gets big. Um, last but not least in this little cartography exercise, we have the make your own language at all. This is where we came from with Tremor. Um, it consists a bit between the two others, while it takes some of one, some of the others, um, <clears throat> and it comes at the cost of having, and was mentioned before, a rather big runtime um, that allows you to do most of the logic you'd usually have to write in a programming language like Java. Um, in a scripting language, it's easy to learn for operational folks and not so heavy, not so resource intensive as something heavyweight. So that's it for the little exercise in geography for event processing systems. Um, <clears throat> let's talk a bit about Tremor script because, well, we talked about scripting, so this is the natural conclusion of that. Um, Tremor script is a ETL language. So basically, what happens with locks in Wayfair is we parse them, we transform them, like changing fields, changing data in them, we filter some out we care about, sanitize them, and it is mostly, and I'm embarrassed to say that, JSON-esque data. Um, not, not a fan of JSON, but it is a world we're living in, so we suck it up. Um, it is not a language we love in the sense of that we didn't design it to be a beautiful language. We designed it to be a language which gets the stuff done that operational teams need to get done. Um, and sometimes those two things are at odds. As a programmer, you want some beauty in the language. As an operational person, you just wanted to get it done. Um, so we came from that side on it. It is heavily influenced by Rust for obvious reasons. Um, and by Erlang, since both Dar and me have been happy Erlang users for years, and we try to spread the Erlang goodness wherever we can. Um, last but not least, there's a good pinch of what was needed in there. So we looked at all that we had, well, we had the big fortune to being able to look at thousands of nodes with configurations and see how they are used and how you can making, how you can make some kind of this more efficient, more easy to use, more friendly for the operator while also making it fast. Um, so, well, let's jump into it. We are going to release the version 08 of Tremor. Um, we decided we're going to do that over the last few days and got it nearly release ready today. So that's why I rewrote the entire talk. I was going to talk about something slightly different, but no, we are going to talk about the 08 release. Um, partially because 
we are following an RFC driven process or try to follow an RFC driven process. And this is in the last stretch of it. So if any of you is interested after this to give their comments and to tell us what we did wrong, um, please do. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to share a bit about what is new in the 08 release. Um, we are going to introduce new modules. So logical encapsulation of code. We are going to use use to introduce a use keyword which allows us to include those modules from different files and make structuring the code easier. I suspect most of you will see the Rust influence here. Um, we literally stole the keywords. I hope we're not going to be um, sued by Mozilla. Um, we added functions so it is possible to write your own functions with logic in them and intrinsics to hook up Rust functions easily over this um, new function module. So let's look at the components of those. And first of all modules, they are, I would say, while probably the most powerful of the set, also the most boring. Um, they just encapsulate, you can have your module and you see it here, it's called mod my mod with and um, we have a constant defined in it, which is the answer 42. And we have a function defined in it, which takes two arguments, A and B, and adds them together. The function is called add for obvious reasons. Um, we then can call this function outside of the module by prefixing it with the module, a double colon, the name of the function, my module answer, and minus 19. Again, it is probably visible that there is a lot of Rust influence there um, with a bit of Erlang mixed in with with and 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 keywords. Um, <clears throat> so they can be nested if you want as so you can define one module in another module in another module um, and get the nested structure pretty much like you can do in Rust. Something you can't do in Erlang by the way which we always miss so we made sure we get it in. Um, use clause um, which you can see it on the right use foo the little box with the code above it is the content of foo. Um, so the file foo.shramer includes const snot equals badger. Um, the second file, the one we are calling, is, is using use foo to include that file. And then it matches on the event. We are an event processing engine. All our scripts handle an event. Um, <clears throat> and if the event is a empty struct, so in JSON empty object, um, we output the string snot followed but by whatever was in the constant snot in the module foo. In this case, it would be badger, so we get a snot badger. Um, we are doing that via pre-processing, so we don't cache modules in the sense of that we have multiple source files at the end that get linked together because it's an interpreter, not a compiler. Um, so we just concatenate them as a pre-processor step and add them together. And to illustrate that at the bottom in the big box, you can see how the preprocessor output would look like. Um, those files are taken for the observant amongst you from a test called pp underscore nest zero. Um, <clears throat> and we have a line directive, which is a compiler hint later on that tells us we are in this file at this line that allows us to have error numbers and line numbers and errors. Um, and then the module foo, which we included, gets put into a module class, so module foo with and so on. The content get added, const snot equals badger, and we close the module we created with a semicolon. And after that, we have another line directive, which now tells the lexer and parser and compiler later on that we are now even so technically in line five, would be in line two of the original files. So if we get errors, it can point in the right direction. Okay, <clears throat> so much for use. Let's go on and look at functions where it, where it, this is where it becomes interesting. Um, the simple most function aside of add is just a function, a name, a list of arguments with a function body and an end. So snotify here takes a variable, probably a string, and creates a new string with snot followed by whatever you passed in. Um, so this allows you already to define a lot of small algorithms internally and abstract away part of the 
logic of your code into small functions you outsource to a module somewhere and go in and reuse. Um, this whole was a bit of background story. This whole um, thought experiment, aside of we wanted functions, but we don't do what we want, we do what we must. Um, Beside us wanting them, we found that a very common pattern for the users were outsourcing parts of code into templates for the configuration management system and then cobbling them together inside a output template at the end. And I'm like, oh, well, wow, this, is, this is horrible. There was something in programming that solved this problem before, which is modularity. So we got functions and modules out of that. Um, anyway, we take parameters, we combine them, so we call the snotify function we defined with badger and the result of that is snot badger. Um, but that is not all. Um, we thought, well, we like Erlang and Erlang has this wonderful feature of allowing you to write a function with patterns in the argument definition. So you can execute different kinds of bodies based on the arguments that are passed to a function something which would be really lovable in Rust. And I saw the Josh earlier tweeting about something like that with um, enums. And I hope that gets into Rust because that would be awesome. Anyway, I digress. Um, we are talking about functions with um, patterns. So <clears throat> we use case for patterns. That is a Erlangism in a way. Um, so a change from function name arguments or with to function name arguments off. And then we have a set of cases and a default case if none of them hit. Um, so the first case compares if the passed in argument was a string with a content of badger. If yes, it returns not badger, hell yeah. Um, the second one is what we call an extractor. So since extracting data from strings is a incredibly common pattern in operational use of those engines, um, we made that a first level construct. And here we are using the, ext the JSON extractor, JSON pipe pipe, which looks if the string is a valid JSON and then creates the JSON out, it, out of it. Um, <clears throat> so then, after that, if it was a JSON, we have an object and we set the sub key snot of the object to true and return the new modified object. Um, a third case in this function would be looking at the input S and if it is a string, then return snot followed by the string, the same as the function before. Um, now, if none of those case, cases match, since it is an expression-based language and we always has to, we have to return something, we have a default case and that just tells you like, well, you called that with something that is not working. So <clears throat> putting in a few examples here, that would be snotify from Badger and we get the expected hell yeah, snotify of a horse, which got a snot horse, snotify of 42, which falls into the default, well, we get the error we defined and last but not least, snotify with a JSON that is badger42, returns a parse JSON of the type of an object or record in Tremor um, with two keys. One is badger42, which was the one we had before and the key snot because it's snotify set to true. So, so much about the matching on functions. Um, since that wasn't enough, we figured we add variable args. So <coughs> functions, you can pass a arbitrary number of arguments. Sometimes you really need that. Think about the print line macro we have in Rust and that, well, that has to be a macro, it can't be a function. Since we don't have var 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 variable arguments, sorry, my brain is breaking. Um, here we define a function, it's not all the things three dots for this is var args. You could prefix it with a number of given arguments you always expect, so a minimum number of arguments. Um, in this case, we don't. And we simply have snot and then followed by the arguments. So if we call snot all the things with snot, uh, three arguments, badger, horse, and cat, we get snot badger, snot horse, and snot cat out of it. Um, <clears throat> this can be quite powerful in itself if you're going to write more complex functions and look at the number of arguments and what you got passed in. 
Last but not least, since no, no functional language or semi-functional language is complete without recursion, um, we added recursion so you can write functions that call themselves. Since performance is something we really care about, um, we enforce tail recursion by um, using a special keyword for the recursion, uh, which we call recur. Thank you, closure, perhaps someone remembers it, and pass it the argument. If that is not called somewhere in the tail, then, well, it will error during compile time and tell you you can't use recursion that is not tail recursion. Um, <clears throat> so here we have an example of the implementation of the Fibonacci sequence. And we write two functions here. One is Fibonacci of n, which calls Fibonacci underscore of 0, 1, and n. And then the next one, Fibonacci underscore, it has to define first because otherwise it doesn't know what to call, which prevents uh, trampoline-like recursion. Um, so it has to be defined first and we look if n was, was larger than zero, we call recursion with, well, the math behind it. If it wasn't larger than zero, we return a and are done. So if we want run this in a compre for comprehension, not a loop, again, nothing infinite can happen here. Um, <clears throat> so we run it over a range of the numbers of zero to 10 and call Fibonacci of them, we get the array 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, and 34. Um, the recursion depth is limited even so we do not consume extra stack for them because we want to enforce that every event that ever goes into the Strema script engine is deterministically to guarantee to go out and not block forever. So the default we set it to is I believe 8,000, but that might become more configurable later on. Um, so this was a short rundown of the changes in Tremor 08, which is going out tomorrow um, as a pre-release. Otherwise I get in trouble if I don't say that. Um, if you want, come by, comment on it, give us your ideas, share what you think is a terrible idea what we are doing before it's too late. Um, and <clears throat> Uh, a reminder here, Tremor script, this engine is not hardly bound to Tremor the project, so you can use the scripting engine inside any project you like. There's a crate for it even. You can do cargo and then put it in your crates.toml. Um, anyway, last but not least, we wanted to use the chance to give a shout out to a few open source projects which have been elemental to Tremor to building this um, and the Rust community as a whole, to be honest, because it has been a really, really, really great time. Um, <clears throat> so we open sourced February this year. We have been preparing for this for nearly a year because we wanted to do it right, like the RFC process, like getting all the repositories in the open. Um, and we are by now at the point where all development happens in the open. There are, isn't even a internal project board anymore. There are just GitHub issues. Um, we, as people who have been in open source for years before we joined Wayfair, value collaboration and that is hugely important to us which is why we added the section um, and where we can we try to give back so some of the libraries we built like tremor script like Cindy Jason they are available for everyone as their own projects so people can start using them um, the first shout out we wanted to give is to the Microsoft research crew in Cambridge um, they have built an allocator called SNM alloc or how I can't get it out, out of my head anymore, Smelloc. Um, <clears throat> and it is heavily optimized for a producer consumer pattern with multiple threads. So one thread produces data, it gets sent to another, this thread consumes it and frees the, mem frees the memory again, um, which is a perfect alignment with what we are building with Tremor and has given us a huge boost in performance. So if you're building an application that follows this patterns of producing data in one thread and consuming it in another, give SNM alloc a go. The, the people behind it, um, especially Matthew, are incredibly 
incredibly helpful. They reached out. We talked a lot to them. Um, as a result of the benchmarking we did to them, there has been two improvements done by them on the engine, which gave us, I think, a total of 3% more throughput. Um, and two more are in progress, which I'm really excited to see what comes out of that. Um, there's a link in here, which is to the C version of the allocator, but there is also a Rust crate, which you can find, I'm sure. And the person behind it is Matthew Go. That is his Twitter. I realize we have not figured out how to publish those um, slides, but we will figure it out and give you the slides with the links in them. Um, second shout out to the vector people, um, which are really awesome and nice to work with. We when we open source Tremor, we started chatting with them because there's a lot of overlap in what we are doing. And we were already a little worried that they might, they might see this as a competition, even so we are not a tech company at Wayfair. Um, but absolutely, they have been wonderful. We have been collaborating with them on a few things and sharing ideas and sharing code. Um, Anna of Vector is currently working on a proto buff deserializer in WASM that takes the disadvantages of having to hard compile protobufs into your application away so they can be loaded at um, starting time instead. Um, we've been talking about generalizing interfaces for things and sources or how Tremor calls it on ramps and off ramps. So how you get data in and out of an event processing system and hope to provide a bit of an ecosystem and rust around that. Um, we have been talking about SIMD JSON, which came from Tremor to be integrated in Vector eventually to increase the performance of, um, <clears throat> of their JSON parsing. I said comes from Tremor, the Rust port comes from Tremor. So we didn't do SIMD JSON because that's the next one. Um, Dr. Lemire did SIMD JSON, um, a incredibly great library. Again, the original library is in C, not in Rust, but um, it is some of the cleanest C code I've ever seen. It is a pleasure to read. If you, are like, if you like this kind of stuff, go check out the C library. Um, look at some really great C code. It is blazingly fast. It is just amazing how that chews through JSON. Um, we have ported this to Rust to be a bit more idiomatic in the ecosystem, in the tools we uh, use in the interaction. It is compatible with CERT in the large degree. Um, but it is by far the fastest JSON path that you can get in Rust by a factor of two in many cases. Um, we have contributed back a few fixes and a few performance tweaks to send the JSON upstream based on measurements and experiences we made with using the port um, in our Rust code base. So that is great. Uh, Mr. Lemire was awesome about it. It's well, I, I love this kind of collaboration. And it makes me always really happy if open source just works. Um, okay, so again, thank you all. Thank you for listening. And um, thank you for being an awesome community. And um, if you're interested in what we have built, there is tremor.rs, which you can go to there. All the links, everything from Slack to Twitter, to our documentation, to whatnot. Um, come by, say hi. We have about uh, 100 stickers left if you want some, say a word. Um, we have a Twitter account called Tremor Depths, um, and you can follow us there or not follow us there. And that would be it for the talk. I have no idea how I did on time because I forgot to start the clock. No, that was great. Thank yeah. you very much, everybody. Thank Digital you. claps all around. Great talk. Thank you. So uh, we have we do have a couple of minutes for some questions. Awesome. Um, there was definitely some great chats uh, happening inside of the Matrix uh, instance that we had. The first one we had was: Is the Tremor API compatible with Logstash? No. Um, <clears throat> Tremor is has multiple on ramps and off ramps. We mostly consume data over. Kafka within Wayfair. That is where most of the data comes from. And yes, if you have a Kafka topic you read from Logstash, you can now read this Kafka topic from Tremor. Um, the HTTP API is not the same at all. Um, we didn't try to build a new Logstash because, well, mistakes were made. Um, without hate for Logstash, every project has mistakes. And Tremor will have the uh, other ones. Um, but we want to make our own mistakes and learn from the mistakes others made before. Um, so in the API sense, it's not compatible, 
compatible, but a lot of what you can do with Logstash, you can do with Tremor, Tremor just slightly differently. Cool, thank you. Um, the next question was, I think it's already answered, but it was um, what sort of throughput does Tremor get? Um, yes. That is a hard question because it depends on the hardware you're running it, uh, the algorithms you put into it, and the data you are going through it. Um, benchmarks are always lies, um, but I will share the, our go-to benchmark, which was up to 500 megabytes a second of parsing JSON, processing JSON, like uh, filtering it, changing some keys in it. It's based on a production use case in Wayfair, um, just anonymized, and then re-serializing it. So that was up to 500 megabytes a second. Then again, your mileage will vary, and it will probably be slower unless you're using exactly that use case, or faster if it's easier. Cool, thanks. Right. Um, I think we have time for one more question. This one is a general Rust question, so hopefully you don't mind that. There was a question about, uh, does Rust have tail call recursion optimization? I am nearly sure it does. Otherwise, I would be really sad. But LLVM <laughs> is pretty good at most things, like inlining and whatnot. I would say that Rust does, but I'm just pulling that out of my ass. I'm pretty sure the answer is it can it Sometimes does tail call recursion, yeah. but there is absolutely no guarantee uh, oh, whatsoever yeah. that it will work. That's probably true. Not everything can be made into tail call recursion after all. Yeah. Um, great. Oh. Okay, so we're going to uh, thanks again uh, Thank for you. the great talk, oh, Heinz. That was really great. More uh, digital claps all around. Um, you can continue your uh, your questions in our matrix chat that we have. Um, and we are going to take a 15 minute break um, and we're going to break out into some breakout rooms for those that would like to chat with others about the talks that we've had or about other things. Please uh, remember that our code of conduct still applies in the breakout uh, rooms. Um, and uh, if you would not like to participate, it's fine to turn off your camera and your, uh, and your mic and uh, step away, have a drink of water. And we will be back in about 15 minutes with our last talk of the day uh, from Yash and then um, a quick coding challenge for everyone. So enjoy the break, everyone. Thank you very much. Be back. Um, I think we are ready to go with the last talk of the evening um, from Yash. We're going to have Yash, and then after that, we will have a small coding challenge um, where we can talk about some Rust code together and end out the night. So, without further ado, Yash, uh, take it away. Yeah. Oh, wow. I can unmute myself. Amazing. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Screen shared. All right, can everyone see this? Wait, wait, I see exactly one face. Er Eric Simler, if you can see this, wave your hands. <laughs> Amazing, okay, great. <laughs> That's just the first check pass. Uh, great, um, so hi everyone, I'm Yash. Uh, this talk is called async HTTP. Uh, whoop, click, yay, okay, which means it's not about everything in async HTTP, it's just here's a bunch of stuff that we have done in the realm of async HTTP. Uh, which includes me, Yash, and uh, my co-conspirators, collaborators, friends, uh, <laughs> esteemed colleagues, uh, Ryan, who's right over there, and, and Friedel, uh, who I don't think is on the stream, um, and many, many other people. It's about three libraries that we've written, co-written, basically. Uh, so, yes. Uh, so, what are we going to talk about today? I'm trying to keep it, keep it like a little short talk. Uh, oh, hey. Yes. Okay. So we're going to talk a brief history, brief overview of like what's happened in async Rust uh, since the beginning of async Rust, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it's just very brief. <clears throat> um, Going to take a quick look at HTTP REST today, which is our GitHub org and the stuff where we work and do these things under. Uh, I'm going to look at some, um, some goals we had that we set out uh, recently to be like, oh, here's some things that we wanted to do. And then we're going to look at what we did. Um, that's the basic structure. Uh, so without further ado, uh, a brief history of uh, future async, async rest, brief history of async. Uh, so back in August 2016, futures were announced on Aaron's blog. Uh, 
Um, so it's like uh, almost four, three and a half years ago. Then in uh, April of 2018, um, so fu futures were like, here's zero cost like state machines and they're very cool and they're very fast. And then April 2018, uh, PIN came along, uh, which was, uh, I think, ADB and then definitely boats <laughs> took sort of the, the helm there, um, which was like, uh, here's how we can make these things even faster. So we don't need to allocate like a whole lot. And future 0.2 came out. So future 0.1, future 0.2. Then in uh, July of 2018, turned into future 0.3. It's pretty soon after. And that pretty much uh, remained for a year until uh, July of 2019, when uh, we got the future trait in, uh, instead, like proper. So it was uh, future 0.3, uh, experimental, beta, I forget, the unstable. I forget what the name was. But then in, in July of 2019, we got future like, properly in, uh, instead. And then in November of 2019, which is last year, uh, we got async await unstable. And now we're a couple months further and we're uh, officially in the time that we call the async await MVP uh, still. Um, the bare minimum works to make async await work and um, it's early days. So uh, first takeaway from, from this little history here is that in the last three and a half years, a lot has happened, a lot of iterations have happened, um, and a lot of things have only recently become possible, like to go mainstream. So we're, we're still trying to figure out like, what's the best way to use async routes? What are the right ways to, what are right patterns? When should we use it? What are the trade-offs? You know, we're, we're getting a feel for it. And th this will continue to like uh, phase out over the years. And, and many of the things that came before this uh, maybe we're not the best options. We're still exploring uh, how to go forward. Um, but at the same time, um, there's also this other tension, which is like, in order to keep going forward, the parts that we agree on, uh, we need to keep stabilizing those. So there, there's a part of exploration, but also part of stabilization. Um, as you could see, uh, stuff like pin got stabilized, stuff like the future trade got stabilized. And as we go forward, likely we'll look at streams, we'll look at the async read and async write APIs. Um, and, and keep carving forward so that people can share more and we, we agree on more things. Um, that's a bit of attention there. I say this because I get a lot of comments about like, you're not stabilizing things. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but we also need to keep exploring, you know, so there, there's some stuff there. Um, anyway, um, HPRS today, that's a little GitHub org right there. There's uh, people in the org. <laughs> I took a private screenshot, so, you know. You can see two, two little faces there. Um, main projects are uh, Tide and Surf, which uh, Surf is an HTTP client framework. Uh, there's a little uh, Surf example here. Oh, or you can um, see like Surf get, uh, you give it a little URL, then you await it, and then you get back a response. Uh, and you can like give it more parameters if you like, uh, Surf get dot body dot something dot, uh, all sorts of parameters. And then it, get, it gets converted into a future first call you call await on it. Um, then with streams, you can see a little fun example. So um, the, uh, this should be, should be, a, this should be a response. The response is streaming, so we can take a take a little request here or actual response, and pipe it out into a file, and it will like copy all the bytes that are going into uh, or coming from the request and stream them directly into a file until uh, the request is done, or until we get there, uh, which returns I/O error here. Uh, does it? Yeah, it does. Anyway, so that's uh, surf. It's nice, nice and a little convenient. Uh, this Tide, or at least what we're trying to get to with Tide, which uh, create a new Tide app, uh, create a new Tide server. Then at the route slash, we uh, for the HTTP get method, um, we give it a callback, uh, an async closure, and then we return a high from there. It's basically like a little hello world. We listen on localhost 8080, and then we asynchronously uh, process requests. Now the the thing here is like we have a, this almost working in this exact shape. Um, is that the core of this code uh, is three lines for an HTTP server with like routing, um, which is fairly small and fairly competitive um, with a lot of other languages. Uh, Rust is a C replacement is many times how, how people like to think about it. Um, but the, the ergonomics part is like something that like, is really good in Rust and I feel not necessarily always the focus or the, the thing that's brought forward as like, one of the best benefits, but you know, uh, what did we say? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so my opinion is uh, Rust should, should be and can be and is competitive with ergonomics um, for other lang in, other, uh, in other languages. All right, so that's, uh, that's a little brief history of um, 
of async and rust and some of the stuff that's like going on today. Um, so what are the goals? So we set out with a few goals. We already had like serve and tide and these things look really good. Uh, I think like they're, they're quite usable. Um, but we had some problems internally with the, the layers that we were using internally. There was a lot of like patching over things, abstracting over things. It just didn't feel quite right. So we um, set out to, to try and figure out like, hey, can we make the internals of the frameworks that we're building as nice as the external APIs? Um, we had some ideas about that. Now, uh, a, a thing that we really wanted to do is like all the way through, throughout the whole thing, um, do composition uh, using byte streams. So, or well, streams in general. Um, so in part, that means um, get, it, ah, sorry, just clicked a little thing and I'm like out of train of thought. Um, so it, it, it means like, ah, byte streams. Okay, byte streams. Yes, that's what we want. Next point. <laughs> um, a, a clear goal for us, uh, something that we really wanted was to define clear boundaries between layers. So for example, um, something that we were missing that we weren't seeing in the ecosystem quite yet was a streaming HTTP encoder and decoder that didn't do any I.O. Uh, by itself. Um, so for example, if you want to get uh, do HTTP over uh, Unix uh, streams, um, that should be possible because that should be decoupled from, from the exact uh, TCP definition. All it uh, uses is like the uh, async create, async write APIs and the stream API. Um, so by, by decoupling that, you get these very nice layered APIs, um, same for encryption, same for like HTTP decoding and coding. Um, so that, that was like a goal that we were like, hey, can we do that? Is that possible? Uh, because that would enable a lot of people to, to be very flexible in how to use these things. Um, so yeah, like uh, running HTTP over, over Unix domain streams or Unix streams is, is like an actual use case that people have or file or, you know. Um, so, we sort of also the other one, uh, we're kind of like looking at like, oh, what's the perfect tight API if we could write one? Um, this is pretty much what a proxy server would look like. So you get a request, you give it as a body for um, like here, this thing, and you proxy this call, you stream out the whole thing back to the other thing, and then you get back a response. And now you can take that and like stream it back out. Um, like writing a whole proxy should be about like five lines. It's, again, very aspirational, but we're like pretty close to this. Um, so we were like, hmm, how, how can we make this work? Um, so introducing three new libraries. Uh, we wrote about this last month, but yay. Now we're doing a little talk on it, uh, which is async h1, HP types, and async native TLS. Um, so the way these things work together is that the top layer, you have the framework, such as Titer Surf. Then there's an abstract interface. And these libraries, they, they work as the backends for the, behind this abstract interface. So Tide and Surf, they have modular backends. So if you want to write like a, a Surf client and use a WebAssembly backend in the browser, then you know, it's, it's powered by something else. Uh, then for example, curl, then for example, async h1. Um, there's a little encryption layer usually, there's a parser, there's a runtime. Um, and they're all like tied together through like shared types so you, they can communicate with each other. Um, the way it looks in Surf is at the top layer, we have Surf, which is the end user interface. HTTP client is the abstract interface. And async TLS, async H1, together with async std, they sort of form the foundation and HTTP types brings it together. Uh, for tied with something similar, except it's tied and HTTP service instead of HTTP client. So that's, that's a little uh, backend. So the, the way you can use, so sort of focusing on, um, I don't know if y'all can see my mouse, but uh, we're just gonna talk about the async TLS, async H1, async std part, where you have a runtime and like encryption and a uh, little HTTP encoder, decoder, is that the way you put those together to, to start making those HTTP requests um, is not that much code right now. So th this is all the code that's required for um, to make an actual like HTTP request asynchronously in Rust uh, today. Uh, so you open up a TCP stream, you get the address out, you create a URL, you, you create a request, then you pass all these things into like, um, you convert the stream into an encrypted stream, does a handshaking for you, et cetera. And at the end of the day, you um, convert the encrypted stream. You say like, okay, over this encrypted stream, we're now going to run um, like our HTTP request. And you send out the request, it streams back the response, it does the encryption, et cetera, behind the scenes. It's like not too much code. Uh, but if you're looking at this, you might be like, hmm, that's kind of difficult to read. So what we're like trying to get at, and we're not quite here yet, but we've like been talking about it, is create a URL and like have a, a notion of TCP stream, TLS stream, HTTP stream. 
and sort of work your way down where uh, here we create a stream that we pass into the next stream that we pass into the next stream together with like a request and then you get back a response. Um, the, like the, the idea is that, you know, making requests and doing this thing uh, should really be concise and just natural to write out. And you're like, oh, okay, I see what goes on. If you want to remove um, encryption or you want to do encryption over a different layer, you just swap out the, the backend. So instead of TCP stream, you could do um, Unix stream. Instead of a TLS stream, you could, for example, do some other encryption layer. Or maybe you want to use this uh, TLS encryption with not HTTP at all, but some other protocol, you know? Um, so yeah, this provides us with the necessary flexibility for that. Um, or at least that that's what we're aspiring to. And this is the uh, server equivalent. I'm not gonna linger too much on this because it's still like in a semi-broken state. <laughs> but what we're trying to do is um, recently released also a crate called Parallel Stream, which allows you to, for every incoming request or every incoming thing in the stream, spawn a task and like join all the handles. Um, yeah, that's basically the idea. We do the inverse where we decrypt uh, the incoming connection and we, we turn that into an HTTP accept and stuff like connect. Anyway, um, something nice that we did with this series of crates is um, we now have uh, HTTP aware error handling. So HTTP types, which is the shared types abstraction that doesn't do any IO, has a notion of um, what a HTTP error is, which is a box error with a status code and uh, has a nice little shorthand, which is the HTTP types of results, an HTTP aware result. Um, any error that exists, you can get um, uh, the, uh, the status uh, trait. You can, if you get in scope or you just import the prelude, then every error gets a dot status or every result gets a dot status method that you can use to just give it qu like quickly give, give a response a status. Uh, otherwise, when it's cast, it'll like default to 500, um, which is quite nice. So here, for example, we're like reading a file and if something doesn't hold or if we like get an error, it just returns a 501. And all the way at the top inside the frameworks, it's intended to then look at the error and be like, okay, cool, uh, get the status code and act based on that. Um, yeah, having errors that are aware of status codes is really beneficial when writing like um, code all the way through. And yeah, we just found this to be very nice uh, working on integrating it. Um, so yeah. The three crates that we provide now are HTTP types, uh, which is on uh, docs.rs under HTTP types is the docs page. So we uh, have a notion of what MIME types are. We have a notion of what cookies are, headers, et cetera. Um, and we're like looking to, to even add more things such as, you know, uh, full type constructors for certain like things. Um, there's a lot of things in the HTTP spec that are like, they can only be constructed a single way or a specific amount of, yeah. You know, just having type constructors is, is very nice and just fits into this. Trying to build up the dictionary of HTTP uh, things that, that can be done in a type of way. Um, the second one is async h1. Uh, this is what the docs page looks like. There's two functions, accept and connect uh, for now. Uh, then there's async native TLS, which is a little bit more, but also on crates.io. And uh, finally, since we made this thing, since, since we released, uh, wrote another crate with the help of a uh, Go to bus stop, which is a friend, um, which is async SSC, uh, async dash SSE, uh, which provides a, a async service and events uh, for Rust. So we're we're working towards uh, getting like service and events in, which is like a unidirectional version of WebSocket. So your server can send events over um, an existing HTTP connection to clients, and clients can uh, act on that. Uh, has some caveats compared to WebSockets, but it's overall quite useful and now it exists. And this thing also is generic over uh, streams again, over async and it provides you like with a handle to send events on. Anyway, um, that was what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, share the link so you can check it out. Uh, if you're interested in trying out like some fun things around like async, HTTP, use it over, you know, file systems or <laughs> some other like fun, like IO interface. Uh, you can check it out on github.com slash HTTPRS. Or uh, if you want to read the blog post where we introduce uh, many of these things, or just read the blog, uh, blog.ashwabats.com slash async HTTP. Um, thanks a lot. Woo! Yay, thanks. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, we're getting lots of uh, digital claps now. So thank you, Yash, for, for a great talk. Um, so we have some time for a few questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, how do you deal with buffering? 
Um, that is, I would like to know more. What, what is meant by buffering? Uh, so we'll wait to see if they mean there, uh, what they mean there, but I would imagine how do you buffer, how do you keep track of your, of, uh, state during parsing of HTTP uh, requests and responses and hold on to that state while you go through the parsing process. Um, do you reuse buffers for that? <laughs> uh. <laughs> so we, um, there, okay. Depending on how the question is asked, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, like the operating system uh, definitely buffers. Uh, there's buffering in the operating system. Uh, we don't do buffer. We haven't shown buffering yet in at this layer. Uh, but if you want to introduce some form of like back pressure, some form of like extra buffering, uh, you could just plug it in. It could just be another form of a stream. Uh, could be another thing where you set limits. Um, recently, wrote a post about uh, parallel stream, uh, and we explored the the concept of limits. It doesn't exist yet uh, in this version. Uh, there exists crates on crates IO which provide limits, I forget what the name is, um, but there, there are controls that can be implemented to uh, actually provide like a maximum amount of like requests start like in flight and start rejecting things. Uh, I think the AWS team has like lots of content about how to correctly go about buffering uh, as well. So it, it's definitely possible. <laughs> I just haven't, yeah, all right. Does that make, do, yeah, yes. Makes sense to me. Okay. But uh, we can see if people want to follow up with that. Right. Um, and I think the second question was, or oh, it's sort of the same, what if the other end sends more than you can handle or the consumer doesn't consume? Falls in. So this uh, sounds like a question of back pressure. Um, so generally, like uh, whatever uh, controls you are used to having, can be implemented in this model. Um, we just haven't done so yet. Um, the controls that we currently provide uh, live at the async state level, uh, where um, there's like a TCP timeout, uh, it's just a socket flag that's set. Um, there's like a max, like a keep alive thing that can be set. Um, at the HTTP layer, we have a notion of like maximum, uh, some, some basic DDoS prevention uh, stuff that exists, not super elaborate. We have timeouts also. A uh, small notion about that. Actually, I'm not sure if we have actually implemented that, but um, like we we do make sure that uh, we don't consume more than we can handle as well as possible. At some point, if things like stall too long or like ir irresponsive clients uh, connections are actually aborted, uh, that is built in to some degree. But we can always be better. And there are more elaborate controls that could be built that should be built that haven't been built yet. Uh, <laughs> All right, great. Thank you. Um, I think we have one more question, um, and that was, uh, it's not entirely related to HTTP, but um, mm -hmm. about async programming and Rust. Have you considered some notion of cancellation for futures? Like maybe if the user wants to quit the application, um, then you might want to stop taking input, but still finish off all of the input that you are currently processing. Um, do you I have love that question. Such a good question. Um, is, am I still screen sharing? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm just gonna link you to a crate uh, that you can use for this exact thing. Um, it's called Stop Token. Uh, it's made by Alexi uh, from Rust Analyzer fame. Um, and the basic idea is that you, this is a, a channel that can receive an event. And once that event is received, so it, it, you say like, uh, how does it work? Ba, 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 ba. Uh, yes, okay. So here's a stream called work. You wrap it inside of this stop token. And at some point, this uh, stop token will be triggered and will say like, now work needs to stop. Uh, and it will start yielding none. And then the stream consume, like finishes all the work that's been doing, but no new items will be accepted. And you get like a graceful shutdown system. Um, I have some notes on how I think we can uh, maybe tweak the ergonomics for this. Uh, but if you want uh, cancellation, like cooperative cancellation uh, in Rust, in async Rust right now, um, then, then stop token is an interesting one to explore. And I think it's, it, it gets the semantics right for sure. Uh, hope to answer your question. Great. Um, so I think that's it. Although we, real quick, we had one follow-up question. How can people outside of GitHub follow the development? Is there a place to collaborate um, or should it, is it just in GitHub issues or somewhere uh, else? 
That's a great question. So I've been extremely busy recently, so I haven't like really been tracking GitHub issues even. Uh, follow us on Twitter. <laughs> it's uh, Ryan Levick on Twitter, Dignified Choir, and Joshua Vets on Twitter. I, yeah, I know. We're not very coordinated. We just chat. Oh, uh, we, we have a Discord. Yes. Come to our uh, async RS. Wait, hold on. I'm just going to click you to where you can get onto our Discord, which I think is from Tide. No, async stood also has a link. It's the same Discord, uh, just because we're all friends. Uh, there's a chat link here. So if you look to async stood, click on chat. There's rooms for HTTP. Come hang out. Come talk to people. Uh, yes. All right. Great. All right. Thank you very much. More claps for Yash. And thank you to all of our speakers for, for speaking tonight. Um, we have about 20 more minutes um, of the meetup. And uh, the thought was that what we would do is a quick uh, coding challenge. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Uh, come on, Zoom. Be, play nice with me here. Share screen. And we are going to bring this up. OK, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Um, I am going to. Uh, paste this into the various rooms that we have. It's just a link here uh, to a, a playground. So I'm pasting it into our uh, matrix uh, instance that we have. Um, and if I could find it into the Zoom chat, I'm not very good at Zoom. Uh, that's what I've come to the conclusion of. Um, if somebody could paste that into the Zoom chat as well, that would be super helpful. Um, so this is, uh, hopefully everybody can see that and it's, it's large enough on the screen. Also, let me know if it's not. Um, what the challenge uh, is, is basically, uh, this is slightly arbitrary and slightly just coaxed up to be, um, give you some weird and interesting uh, um, kind of uh, challenges uh, with the compiler. But what we're trying to do here, um, and I, don't, I called it client builder because that's what I was doing inside of this code base, um, but you can call it whatever you want. Um, what we're doing is we have an async function down below called do work. And basically, if you know how async functions work, this will produce um, a future that returns a result of either a U8 or um, some kind of um, error, which is hard coded to a tuple here. And our job is to get this to, uh, to go ahead and build um, inside of a lazy static. Um, and for those that aren't aware, um, what lazy static is, is uh, an, a great little uh, library um, that allows you to have kind of uh, statics that are lazily initialized. So in their example here, this hash map static um, uh, is not created kind of uh, at, at first when you run the, the, um, the program, but after you call it for the first time, it will initialize um, and then you have it. And when you refer to it again, you just get that same instance that you, that you initialized before. Um, and so uh, if we go ahead, and by the way, if uh, one thing that you can do, if you have any questions or thoughts or comments or whatever, I'm, I'm monitoring the, the matrix uh, chat. So um, make sure to, um, pop your questions or thoughts in there. Um, and what we're going to do is try and uh, get this to build um, and see if we build it, uh, what kind of error message that we get. And we're gonna go through the process of trying to get this to work. And if you want, you can go ahead and, and just quit now and, and say goodnight for the night and try and work on this on your own um, and watch the, the video once we post that online to see the, the answer um, or you can follow along. Um, and who knows, maybe I won't even be able to, to do it uh, correctly because uh, I've forgotten how it all works. Um, and maybe the, the uh, answer that I have is not the, the absolute best answer, but it will be one answer. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, what we see here down below in the error message is that the trait standard marker sync is not implemented for um, our future that we have here. Um, and so I think the easiest thing to do is just to require that this thing is sync like this and see what happens there. Um, and uh, put it in the wrong place here. Um, 
put it on the result instead of the future itself. So we're moving that over one here. Um, and there we go, it works. Uh, that actually was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, there is another uh, issue that I forgot to add to this as well, is if your type here, which are U8 here, is, uh, is actually sync. But if you have a type that is not sync or something like that, um, then you end up with, uh, with different error messages and, and stuff like that. So give that a try um, and uh, see what happens. Uh, and um, let us know how it goes. Um, and uh, that was it for now. Sorry for the uh, uh, kind of letdown there in, in the demo. Um, all right, that's all we have uh, for today. Any uh, other questions or anything else that you uh, would like to, to say at the end there, Bastian? No, and thank you for the code challenge. I yes. figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It was not so hard, was it? It's nice to end the day like this. Yeah, yeah, um, with a, with a nice you. win. <laughs> um, thank you, people, for joining. It was fun. Um, if you have any ideas of how we can make this even more fun, feel free to reach out. And yeah, it was great. It's nice to be home so fast after a meetup. Yes, and uh, I think there was one mention um, in the chat that um, the Rust Zerk uh, meetup group is, is hosting a meetup next week as well. Oh, nice. um, I don't think we have a link for that uh, ready yet, but uh, we will be retweeting that whenever that uh, gets announced out. Um, and uh, uh, everybody enjoy that, and we'll see you hopefully in uh, four weeks for the next edition. Mm -hmm. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Have a good night. And I thank you, Jan, again for doing all of this. Bye.